as a way of introduction, what we're talking about is balancing career aspiration and mental wellness. And the reason why this topic is actually something very important is because one of the many things I see as a professional counselor is that while people work on trying to get their career goals and all, they usually, in the process, get so much mental health stress that affects them a lot. And if you don't take intentional efforts towards that, that's something you're going to fall into as well. Can you now see if that is not something that you take intentional effort about? While you're chasing your goals, while you're trying to achieve so much at a very young age, you're going to discover that you have so many mental health issues that you should address. And that's something that we should actually look. So in this session, I'm going to be sharing with you strategies. How about now? Yeah, it's visible now. All right. Okay, yeah. I'm going to be sharing with you some strategies that can help to do all of that. And I'm going to make it an, a very interactive session. So please, I will need the cooperation and response from everyone. Thank you so much. Okay, now according to statistics from the Center of Disease Control and from American Psychology, Psychological Education, the Association rather, sorry. Money and work are the two main causes of stress. That's when you ask people, what are the things that are stressing you out? While there's family issues, while there is issues from the things happening in society and all, but trying to get money and trying to fulfill their career goals, career aspiration, trying to chase, do the things of their, that their day-to-day -day work require are the two main causes of stress. In some places, even about 60% of the people are saying that they are getting some level of stress from their work and so on. So if we are truly going to live a balanced life as an individual, then you must be able to learn how to, or if you are going to live a healthy life in terms of your mental wellness, you must be able to learn how to do your work in a way that does not have a serious toll on your mental health. Now we know we spend about 70% of our lives in the workplace. So if that is something that is stressing you, that you can just like 70% of your life is bringing so much stress already. And one of the things that this research found out that I'd like to point out is that when it comes to money and work, the major causes of stress is actually that people are unhappy with their job, that they are doing something they don't like in the first place. So once they are ready that every day is just like hard work, forcing themselves to do it, there's no pleasure, there's no reward and so on. The other people who have so much workload. Now this one also applies to people who are not working in a nine to five job. Maybe you have just a personal goal you're trying to chase. And even those who are working in regular nine to five jobs as well. Once the workload is too much, that you are barely taking time to rest, you are barely taking time to exercise, barely taking time to eat good enough food, it's going to cause stress and hours and so on. So these three things are going to set like a foundation for everything we are going to be discussing moving forward. That, and we're going to find a template that you don't have to totally abandon your big goals in order to stay healthy. I've also noticed that there are a two big category of people. There are those who are so all about their goals that they keep chasing, keep chasing. Their health is deteriorating, but they keep chasing. Then there's another group of people who are so focused on their health and they end up not achieving any goal in life. But you don't have to choose any of them. You can be at the middle and get good results. So now I want to look at what mental wellness is. Mental wellness is not just the absence of mental illnesses. So because it's common even among communities like ours to hear people say, I'm not mad, I'm not having mental conditions, I can think well, that means 
I don't have any mental health issues. But that's not totally true. Mental wellness encompasses our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. Now, let me start from emotional. That's someone who is sad most of the time. Although they might not be roaming on the streets like a mad person, but they are not mentally well because they, they don't have that emotional health. They are not in a good emotional state. That does not mean that every day of your life, you are going to be happy. Every day, you are going to be rejoicing. Every day, you are going to be la laughing. But you should not be in a continuous state of sadness, a continuous state of depression. You should be able to have that perfect balance that when some things are happening that are not so exciting, yeah, you, you are going to, you can grieve over them, you can be sad over them. But after some time, you enjoy pleasure as well. You enjoy play and so on. So that perfect balance is must exist in your emotional state for you to have mental wellness. Then it moves to your psychological state as well. That's your thinking processes, the things that are running through your mind. You don't have some very toxic beliefs that are harming every area of your life. You don't have some cognitive biases. I'm sorry I'm using psychological term here. But cognitive biases are like the way you see things that are not really true. For example, if you think everybody in this world must love me, if you believe that, then that's a cognitive bias. And it's a cognitive bias that can keep you in sadness because it is not possible for everybody in the world to love you. So that falls under the uh, psych psychological category of mental wellness now. That if you hold some beliefs, if you hold some thinking patterns, that are keeping you stuck, then you don't have mental wellness as well. Then it spans also to your social well-being. We as human beings, we are social beings. And regardless of how much of an introvert you are, if you don't have healthy relationships, you are not really healthy. It's going to have a very big impact on your mental health and the way you process things, the way you express yourself, and the way you interpret life, and so on. So, and when I'm talking about friend, um, healthy relationships now, I don't necessarily mean someone you're dating or someone you're married to. At least you should have friends, you should have support systems, people who you can share your burdens with, people who you can share pleasurable moments with, people who you can enjoy time and grow together having that community around you. That's the, that's the social well-being aspect of it. So now this is pointing you to the fact that every of these three areas that I've identified, the emotional, the psychological, and the social wellness, if you don't pay enough attention to it, facing your career goals can destroy or can negatively affect these three areas. For example, it can affect your emotions. If you're just chasing goals, chasing goals, chasing goals, and you're not attaining it, it can make you sad, leading to depression and so on. If in trying to chase your goals as well, you are just so obsessed with it to the point where you begin to neglect your friends, you begin to neglect families, you begin to neglect your children, you know that is affecting your social well-being. Affecting your social, uh, psychological well-being in a, a way as well that you begin to see everybody around you as just instruments to achieve your goals. You are beginning to develop some form of negative thinking. And all of this came from you simply chasing goals. So we see that chasing goals, chasing career goals, chasing, chasing business goals can have an impact on your mental wellness. And that is... A big deal. So the continuation of the definition, it says it affects it impacts it impacts your effectiveness in every area of your life, including your physical health. Yeah, your mental wellness now, this emotional, psychological, and social well-being impacts your physical health. There are several studies out there that have found out that what is happening in your mind, the way you feel, has an impact on your physical health. Stress, for instance, is not something that happens primarily in the body. 
but there are some somatic responses. Somatic responses means things that manifest in your physical body that come as a result of stress. I'm sure every one of us can relate to this in some form that maybe if you are very anxious or very afraid, sorry for the noise. It's no issue. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, sorry about that noise. Okay. I'm sure everyone of us can relate with the fact that if you are in a situation, maybe you are very afraid or you are feeling anxious about something, you notice your stomach will begin to turn. I don't know if anyone has experienced that or you begin to sweat very profusely. Um, these are some somatic responses that are a result of something that's happening psychologically. So it's affecting your physical body. So if you don't pay attention to your mental awareness, it's going to affect your physical health. And it takes someone who is physically strong and mentally strong to be able to achieve goals. So if you are so obsessed with your goals to the point where it begins to negatively impact your mental health and negatively impact your physical health, at the end, you are not going to achieve those goals you haven't set to achieve. So both your physical health and your both your physical health, your mental health, and those goals end up being affected negatively. So you see, it's a complete loss in every area. Now, this is just emphasizing why the balance is necessary. Now, there are several work-related mental health issues that I would like to call our attention to. And the first of it is anxiety. Anxiety. Now, I'm sure we know the word anxious. That's in a state where you are disturbed. There's so many things bugging your mind. You are thinking, how can I get this? How can I do this? I have this deadline that I have to meet up with tomorrow. I have this interview that I have to catch up with. And I'm afraid. I don't know if I'll get it or not. Anxiety is something common with chasing goals. It's very common. And it's a mental health issue. Okay, I'm sure that everyone of us at some point we can feel anxious. That does not mean that every form of anxiety is a mental health issue. But when it is perpetual, when you are constantly not at rest, when it's not as if you are just anxious for a few minutes and you later calm down, but when you are perpetually anxious, your heart is perpetually beating, you are perpetually afraid, then that is a serious issue that can affect you negatively. Another one is stress. Chasing career goals, having, trying to meet all the lofty dreams that you have set for yourself can come with a lot of stress as well. Now, this happens when you don't take time to rest. You just walk in from nine to five, you're working on a project. From five to nine again, you're working on a project. You barely sleep. You barely engage in any leisure activity. And you're just giving it your all, giving it your all. It can cause a lot of stress in your body. And just like I said earlier, stress leaves some somatic responses in your body. That stress does not just end in the mind. It has impact on your body as well, and it can begin to kill slowly if attention is not paid to it, to it. Another mental health issue that rises when we chase career goals is depression. And in bracket, I put failures. Now, it is inevitable that you are going to experience some form of failures when chasing your career goals. For example, you can send your CV for a job application now, and there are 1,000 other people who are sending their CVs. And they only need two persons for that role. So in such situation, now you already know that 998 people are not going to get the job. Not because they are bad, not because they don't have the qualifications, but simply because the role requires two people 
So regardless of how much you try, you are still going to experience some form of failures while chasing your career goals. Now, if you don't handle this well, it is something that can lead to depression, something that can make you just feel the world is working against me. Nothing I'm doing is working. Some people can begin to suspect their family members and say, could be my mother-in-law that's discussing this and all. It can lead to depression, simply trying to chase career goals and not getting, or sometimes you have set a target that I'm trying to make this particular amount by this particular age. Maybe by the time I'm 20, I'm going to be a millionaire already. And now you're 25 and you're still not a millionaire. No, it can lead to depression if you don't handle that well. So that's another one that we are going to learn strategies to avoid. The next is workaholism. Now, workaholism is not a mental health issue, but I'm pointing it out here because it is one of the things that happen when we are obsessed with our goals is that we begin to spend all our life and devote all our time and find our entire sense of worth from the work that we do. So you see someone that if they are to take a day off and rest, they begin to feel very uncomfortable. They don't feel themselves. They, they begin to feel as if something is wrong with them because they are so obsessed with work and everything about their life, everything that matters to them is work-related. Now, this is a sure way of having mental health issues, several mental health issues that I'm not going to list because this is not a class that is trying to give us so much knowledge about the diverse mental health issues that exist or just helping us to avoid them. So we're going to focus more on the strategies to avoid than trying to explore these mental health issues one after the other. Another one is panic attacks. And now I would like to share a story of something that has happened to me in related to panic attacks. I think when I was 21 years old or so, I was trying to start this business online. Please, let me just confirm. Are you with me? Yes, everyone is with you. They are just letting you present and then later on they would ask the questions. All right, all right, yeah. Thank you. Okay, when I was about 21 years old, I was trying to start this business online and it seemed as if it was not working. I was reading all the books. I was watching several videos. I was taking courses. I was trying to network with people who were along that line of business. And, but everything I was doing was not just productive. I remember when I launched like one of the first line of business and I did several, I did Facebook ads. I did ads on with several influencers. And after the serious campaign, then I organized a free training to give more people education about, about the product I'm trying to sell. I did all of that. And in the end, there was only one person that bought my product. Like This was not just the fact that I did not make profit, but I lost even all the money I'd invested in doing the advertisement, in preparing the materials, trying to come up with the product. I could not even get 10% of the money back. Like the business was a massive failure and I lost a lot of money. Apart from that, when I began to check the WhatsApp status, I began to check the Facebook and Instagram stories of the people who were doing the same line of business, who I feel we are colleagues and we are learning these things together, who I even feel that I have more knowledge about it than them. They were making sales. They were crushing their deadlines and getting everything. And it just seemed I was the only one who was feeling. At that point, I spent all my life trying to think what exactly is wrong? What am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? Even I was losing appetite for food, losing appetite for sleep. Until this day, I had a very serious panic attack. My heart was beating so fast. Like my body was kind of shaking. 
I just knew that something was wrong. And in, as at that time, I, I've not even heard of the word panic attack before. I never knew something like that existed. But when I was feeling it, I had to go and search online, that, okay, what exactly is, am I experiencing? And I was able to find out that it's called a panic attack. So at that point, it, the realization just came on me that I have to calm down and just forget about this goal and take care of my health. So this story is just to point to you that if you are so engrossed with your goals as well, you are not the only person. And if it looks as if you are not making the kind of progress you want, you are not getting the kind of result, you are not the only person. But that does not mean you should so sell yourself out to chasing the goal at the expense of your health. So the last mental health issue I'd like to point out as well is burnout. Now, burnout is a point where you lose interest. You kind of lose your passion, lose your interest for chasing anything. Or you can just call it giving up in some sense. That you have just, and you don't just give up on the projects you are engaging on, but you give up on kind of begin to give up on life. And let me put this in context so I don't miss what I'm trying to say. While I was chasing that finance, that my business goal at the age of 21 as well, I think one of the things I experienced as well was that I got to a point where I was burnt out. It's like, what happens with burnout is that you are putting in so much effort, putting in so much effort, and the results you are getting are not matching the effort you are putting. So it can get to a point where you just feel, this thing is not worth it. My entire life is not worth it. I think I'm no more interested. That although you still have a desire to get that goal, but all of a sudden, there's no energy again. There's no passion. There's no drive. And you cannot just encourage or push yourself to towards doing that thing. Now it is, it has been found that we can say burnout is the younger brother of depression. That if it lingers for too long, it can lead you to very serious depression. Some people even begin to get suicidal because of something like that. Just a point where you have given up on the goals and you no longer see a need to chase them. However, all of these things that we have listed and many more mental health issues can be avoided if we simply learn how to balance chasing our careers and maintaining our mental well-being. Now, I'll be sharing eight tips with us that can give us that healthy balance. And the first of it is to detach your sense of what from the attainment of your career goals. While I was talking about workaholism, I brushed on this very briefly, but now I'm going to go deep into it. The works that you do, they are an expression of what you are worth, but they don't define what you are worth. I don't know if you get that. Come in. Let me see if I have a pen here. Your work and your words. Now, your work here comes from what you are what. So it's what you are what that pushes you to do some work. But the work that you do, it is not... Sorry, it's very rough, but I just hope you get what I'm saying. This work that you do, it is not the full expression of everything you are what. For instance, if a carpenter makes a chair, he makes that chair because out of the knowledge that he has, he makes that chair out of his expertise. So 
that chair expresses something he can do. So it's an expression of his what. However, the fact that he made a chair does not mean that that's the only thing he can do. He can make a bed, for instance. He can make a wardrobe. He can make a door and different things that are made of wood. So you cannot look at that chair and use it to define the worth of the carpenter. Although that chair expresses his worth, but it does not define the totality of it. So what I'm trying to point out here is that the works that you do are not the perfect representation of everything you are worth in life. So you are worth more than your work. If you don't understand this, you are continually going to have a lot of stress when you are chasing your career goals. Because it's going to feel like the fact that I could not achieve one millionaire at the age of 25, it means I am a failure. That is not true. Because there is more to you than just the attainment of a singular goal. So whether you attain that goal or not, you are still a worthy person. There are still, still other areas of your life that are blossoming. For example, you might be a very good friend, a very good father. You might be a very intelligent person. And you still have other areas of your life that are blossoming, that are doing well. So you must learn to detach your words from the attainment of goals. So whether I get this goal or not, it does not subtract from what I am. Now, you can know when you have attached your sense of what to the attainment of goals. When, for example, because there's someone in my university, when I was in, my, in, the, in the university, for instance, there was this guy that he failed a project that the school gave him. Then he went ahead to commit suicide because he failed his project in school. Now, what can, how we can explain that is that that guy saw the project in school as the total definition of his life. So the moment he failed that project, he felt as if he had failed in life. He has attached his sense of what the entirety of his life, he has attached it to that single goal. And that is not something you should do. So whether it is financial goal, whether it is career goal, whether it is business goal, any goal at all, your words should not be attached to it. You should constantly remind yourself that although I am chasing this, whether I get it or not, it does not subtract from who I am. I am still a whole person. I'm still a good person. There's still more possibilities in my life. There's still more things I can do with my time. I can still move to a new career path. There are endless options for me. So this single goal does not define me. I am the one that defines the goal and I can cancel that goal anytime. That is the first step. If you don't settle this, then you are just going to continually keep running in and out of therapy sessions because it will continually stress you out. Another reason why you should not attach your sense of what to the attainment of goals Things change. Things change, like constantly the world is changing. So something that you think is important now, maybe your goal is that you are going to you want to get one million rupees, for instance. And one million rupees might look very big to you, but in the next six months, it's looking very small. Or maybe you, all your friends now they don't have one million. So when you have it, it feels as if you are the most successful among your friends. But two weeks from now, you can meet a new, new set of people who have 100 million rupees. So that your 1 million that you're trying to chase is going to look very small. So if your sense of what was attached to that, when this change happened, you are going to be frustrated because these things, everything outside you can change. They are subject to changes in society, they are subject to changes in climate. Any uncertainty can just happen, and these things will change. So if your sense of what is attached to them 
It means your sense of what we continue to fluctuate every day. Today, you are going to feel worthy. Tomorrow, you are going to feel not worthy because things are changing and you are just flowing along and changing with them. So I'm just explaining why we should detach our sense of what from the attainment of goals and hold that mindset that these goals do not define me. I can succeed. I can fail. It does not change anything about me. I am who I am. I'm still a good person. And that's the settled. Okay. The next step or the to create a healthy balance between your mental health and your career aspiration is to avoid setting abstract goals. Avoid setting abstract goals. We cannot talk about growing in our career without talking about goal setting. In fact, success, we can define success as simply the attainment of a goal. A goal is something, okay, I want to get this. That's, you have a goal. Maybe this is what I want to achieve. You can call, the, the, call that a goal. So when you move from point A to this point B, then you said you have succeeded. You have success. However, while setting your goals, if you don't do it well, the goal itself can lead to frustration. The goal itself can cause anxiety. The goal itself can cause stress. That's if you set a abstract goal. Now, let me go into details of what an abstract goal is. When you tell yourself, I'm still going to use the 1 million rupee example. When you tell yourself that I want to make 1 million rupees monthly by the time I'm 25, that is an abstract. That's an abstract goal. I call it an abstract goal because there is no connection between here, okay, this is you here. And this is one, one million here. Sorry about that. This is one million here. Look at all this place. There is nothing in between. That's what's making it abstract. Like there's nothing taking you from where you are to where you want to get to. There's no vehicle to move you from here to here. So because that vehicle does not exist, that is an abstract goal. To change this from being an abstract goal to a concrete goal, what you are going to do is to say, this is me. And this is what I want. Then you must lay out the steps and every action that you must take to get you from here to where you want to go. I don't know if you get what I'm explaining. So to change your goal from being an abstract goal to a concrete goal is that you must have a laid out plan. And that plan should be broken down to daily action steps that can take you from where you are, not where you think you are or where you think you should be, but where you are at the moment. For example, if you are only making 10 rupees per month, that is where you are. So your plan is, what can I do from where I am today that will take me from 10 rupees monthly to 1 million rupees monthly? When you are thinking about that, what you are, trying, what you are doing is called planning. You are trying to create a lay down step for yourself. So you begin to brainstorm, okay, what business idea do I have? Or which career, which job can I take that will give me such amount? Let me use the business example. So you begin to brainstorm on business ideas. Let's say you come up with a business idea that you want to sell courses online. That's what you want to do. So you ask yourself next, what do I know that I can teach people for them to pay me. Once you discover what you know, then you say, okay, how much can I sell this thing that I know? That is the next step. Let's say, for example, you, you come to the conclusion that you can sell it for 100 rupees. Then you ask, how many 
how many copies of my course do I need to sell in a month to get to 1 million rupees? So you know that you need one, two, three. Sorry, I don't know the maths, but I might need to sell close to 1,000 copies per month to get to your one, 1 million rupees. Now that what you are doing is that you are laying out a plan. Now that you know that you need to sell 1 million copies, 1,000 copies, sorry, you then ask yourself, where can I get 1,000 people per month that will buy my course? Now, in the business sense, you also know that you, for you to get 1,000 people to buy your course, for you to get 1,000 million people to buy your course, you might need to market to at least 50,000 people or let's say 10,000 people if you are very good at marketing and conversion and sales, maybe you can convert at a higher percentage. But if you are going with a 5% conversion rate now, you might need to market to at least 50,000 people to make 1,000 sales per month. Then you're going to say, okay, where can I get these 50,000 people? What marketing channels can I use? Am I going to run online ads? Am I going to go to the street, street of Mumbai physically and try to convince people to buy my course. Now, all these steps you are laying out is what is changing your goal from an abstract goal to a concrete goal. Laying out the step. Now, but notice I said that it must come with a daily action step. Now, if on the other hand, when you are trying to bring some on what you know that you can sell, you discover that you don't have enough knowledge to sell anything then you know that the first step you should take in that direction is not to be calculating how much you should market, but you begin to calculate where you can get the re requisite knowledge in order for you to create the course. So you begin to think, okay, maybe I want to create a course on graphic design, for instance, and I don't know how to do graphic design. So the first thing I need to learn is graphic design. I begin to ask what are the graphic design apps or softwares that exist. There's Photoshop, there's CorelDRAW, there's Illustrator. And which one will I need? There's Canva. Which one will I need? Okay, let's say I want to go with Photoshop. Then we check where can I get the courses? Then when you get the course, you mean say, okay, how long will it take me to complete that course? Let's say three months. Then today you know that every day I wake up, my daily task for today is to get up, watch the course, and practice. Notice now that. That idea that we have of getting 1 million rupees, we have just broken it into a daily action step of watch a course for 30 minutes. So when you wake up tomorrow morning, you are not wondering what do I need to do to get 1 million, 1 million rupees. You already know that what you need to do is to watch a course for today. You wake up tomorrow again, you watch a course. Wake up next tomorrow, you watch a course and continue doing that. And if your plan had been carefully laid out is going to look like magic but by just following that plan day to day daily you're going to get to a point where you begin to make that money because you have already laid out a plan that can take you from where you are daily action steps to where you need to get to so after you're taking your course for instance and that three months is completed then you begin to think the next thing is how can i create Oh, yes, how can I create my own course? How can I get people that are going to buy? They are, are going to create another set of plans for that, things you need to do daily, daily. And by getting to that point, and by following that action plan you have laid, you are get, going to achieve the goals you have set. Now, if you don't do this, if you don't do this, and you just leave your, leave your goal at that, trying to get... 1 million rupees per month. You are going to notice that you are simply going to be sad because you are going to wake up the next day and you will not know what to do. You will just be haphazardly trying to do anything that comes your way. Maybe you see your friend doing this today. You follow your friend to do that. Tomorrow you watch a video on YouTube. You follow what that video says. Next tomorrow you see your parents advise you to do something and you do it, and your life will not follow any particular pattern. 
because there's no plan. And that goal that is supposed to move you forward end up frustrating you because you simply left it as an abstract goal. But when you have an action plan, when distractions come that are not in line with your the action plan you have laid, you can easily let go of those distractions because you already know that okay, this is what I want and this is the path I'm going to take that will get me to what I want. Is this point clear? Uh, yes, it is clear. Yeah, thank you. So if you want to maintain a healthy balance between having a mentally healthy mind and still achieving your goals, a good plan is required. A good plan is required. Without a plan, you are going to lose on both areas. Number one, without the plan, you are not going to get the goal. And apart from not getting the goal, you are going to be seriously stressed mentally. You are going to have so much anxiety. You are so, going to have depression, for instance, and so many other mental health issues by simply not having a concrete plan and just setting after goals. Now, the third point that we'll be considering is that you must come to terms with the, with the reality of failure. It is not peculiar to you. I'm grateful I've mentioned this in person while talking earlier, that failure is a part of life. Failure is part of things will not always go as planned. Regardless of how careful you are, regardless of how skilled you are, regardless of how spiritual you are, things will not always go as planned. And it's not because something is wrong with you as a person, but simply because that is how life is in general. For instance, you can still talking about this person trying to sell courses now. The person can spend all his time learning Photoshop, developing the course, doing everything, doing the marketing and so on. And the company that created Photoshop, we just say, we want to stop making our products available. And once Photoshop is not available, for instance. You know that course automatically becomes useless because nobody will want to learn Photoshop because the company has closed down. Now, the person that was creating the course is not failing because he did not plan well. He's failing simply because one company far away in America closed down and the effect of their closing down is affecting his business here in India. So you see that although he planned, although he did everything right, situations beyond his control just came up. The company closed down and now nobody wants to learn Photoshop because Photoshop does not exist anymore. Something beyond his control just happened and stopped his business. So it is the same thing for you now that situations beyond your control can come up at any time. And if you are someone that believes that you are not permitted to fail in life, that everything, every single thing you do must be successful, then you are going to be very sad many times because you are going to be disappointed again and again. You will apply for several jobs, you won't get it. It is normal. You will start many businesses, they will fail. It is normal. You will set financial targets severally, you will not get it. It is normal does not mean anything is wrong with you. It does not mean the world is working against you. It does not mean there are spiritual forces. It does not necessarily mean there are spiritual forces working against you. Sometimes it is just life that is happening and there's nothing you can do about that. But the moment you begin to think that the world is working against you, and nothing is going in your favor, and you begin to take that problem as a personal issue, then 
you are going to begin to invite mental health issues. And the chief of them that is going to come is depression. Now, there are other times where you can experience failure because you simply did not do something right. Not because you as a person are wrong. Notice the difference. There's a difference between this person is wrong, a wrong person, and this person did something wrong. Now, those are two different things. So you can be the right man for the job. You can do all your due diligence, but in the process, you made one mistake. Probably, instead of you to run Facebook ads because they convert more, you went to run Google ads and you end up spending so much money and you get you got very little conversion because the kind of product you are marketing does better with Facebook ads than Google ads. Now, in such a situation, what is wrong was the process you took or the step you took. That was what's wrong. Now, this is also another reason why failure happens. Now, if you are a person that begins to take everything as if the world is working against you, you are not going to pay attention to the fact that you might have done something wrong. You just keep complaining and whining and remaining sad for the rest of your life because you didn't get what you want. But the moment you understand that there are two things primarily that cause failure, that one, it might just be the onset, uncertainties of life that just happened beyond your control. And the second is that you might have done something wrong. So once you, if you understand this and you take away that thinking that something is wrong with you or the world is working against you, you'll be able to look into the situation and identify which of these happened. If it is the first situation where it is just the uncertainties of life that happened, then you know okay, what you need to do is to come up with a new plan and try to adjust and try to adapt to the new trends of what is happening. However, if you look at it and you discover that some of the strategies you employed are the ones that caused the issue, then you can adjust your strategy and still chase that same goal and you're going to get it. So you see, by coming to terms with the reality of failure now, you are both protecting your mental health by the fact that you don't continually remain sad for every failure you face. But on the other hand, it also puts you in a point where you can attain your career goals because now you can now look at things objectively rather than looking at them with emotions that have covered your eyes. I hope you get what I'm explaining. Yeah. Okay. So you must come to terms with the reality of failure. Failure is normal. It is normal. It is not a problem that is peculiar to just you. So don't always move to depression, move to burn, to burnout, move to sadness because you didn't get what you want. You can simply readjust your strategies or adapt to the new trends and keep moving. And if you don't stop, you are going to get what you want. All right, now we will move on to the fourth point. And that is pressure doesn't kill. Okay, this point might be looking different from the ones we have considered before. And I'm going to explain why I had to add this one now. Remember I told you that when it comes to mental health, and career goals, there are two broad categories of people. Firstly, there are those who are so obsessed with their goals that they keep chasing it and chasing it at the expense of their physical health, at the expense of their relationships, at the expense of their mental health. They keep chasing it, and in the end, they end up regretting it. Then there are those who are so focused on their mental health that they don't want to stress themselves they don't want to do engage in any hard work. 
They don't want to chase any goal. They are just relaxed and laid back about life. And those people end up becoming failures in their career. Because like I explained in the last slide, failure can also come when you are not following the right strategies. So these people who are so laid back and relaxed, they are following the wrong strategy to success. So they don't get success. Now, I added this slide here to emphasize to you that you don't have to fall into the second category of people who are so obsessed with their mental health that they end up being very unproductive. You are not going to get at your career goals without some form of pressure. Pressure does not kill. So you have to get up every day and do the hard work. I know we now live in a generation where we prioritize smart work. And I keep saying people saying, work hard, work smart, don't work hard. Work smart, don't work hard. But the super, so if you follow that advice, you are going to get some level of success. Yes, if you work smart, you're going to get some level of success. But the super successful people are people who work smart and work hard. So you don't choose one. You are working hard. You are also working smart. Now imagine someone who works smart for one hour and another person who works smart for 10 hours. Who is going to get the most result? Of course, the second person that works for 10 hours. Although he's working smart, he's still working hard. He's putting the energy, putting in the time, putting in the resources. So he's working hard and working smart. That is going to give you, that's what's going to make you really come out at the top. So pressure does not kill. You have to sit down every day and say, for this amount of hours, I'm going to do this work. I might be tired. I might feel like resting. I might feel like just eating and going on bed. But I recognize that there is a need and there is a goal I'm trying to achieve. So I'm going to get up and do the work. Your brain is a muscle. And all muscles, just like your hands, your biceps, they stretch with exercise. So the same way you see a bodybuilder now, or a gym bro, he goes to the gym every day and he, carry, and he carries heavy weight. And with time, his muscles, his chest begins to develop. That's the same thing that happens with your brain. That the more you exercise the brain, the more you engage in engage it in activities, the more you keep using it, even when it looks, even when you feel tired, then the more it's going to develop. And things that you could not do before, things that you think, I don't know this, I don't understand this, but by the use of the brain, it continues to develop and those things be begin to get easy for you. So pressure does not kill. You have to still work hard, work hard. And there is something called atrophy. Let me spell it. Now, atrophy is a situation where your parts of your body begin to decline in their effectiveness, in their function, simply because you don't use them. So if you are the person that always wants to rest, rest is not enjoying, rest, rest is not um, always resting. Okay, let me say it this way. Always resting is not healthy. Rest is only healthy when you balance it with work. Walking alone is wrong. Resting alone is wrong. But once you connect both of them and you have a healthy balance of walking and resting, then you are in a healthy spot. So although this is a mental health class where I'm emphasizing that you need to pay attention, you need to have more self-care and all, but self-care should never come at the expense of doing the necessary work, except you don't want to achieve your career goals. That's when you can spend all your life trying to do self-care. And then you're going to end up a failure. But there, there should be that balance that I work and I rest. I rest and I work. 
I walk and I rest, I rest and I walk. That's the healthy balance. Okay, so now the fifth point in creating the healthy balance is to leverage the support of your social networks. And by social networks, I mean your friends, your family, your colleagues to ease off the burdens. Remember that mental health is not just the absence of mental illness, but having emotional, psychological, and social well-being. So now this time around, we are emphasizing the social well-being aspect of it. That while chasing your career goals as well, you should make sure you have strong social networks, strong support systems. People, people that give you emotional support, people that you can share the load of what's happening with you, people that when you are stressed, you can call them and say, I'm feeling tired. They can give you some form of encouragement. They can be there for you. This is the social well-being aspect of it. Because if you are carrying all the load by yourself. Now, one thing I did not say when I was talking about the business I tried to start at the age of 21 was the fact that I was the only one doing it. Now, I spoke up, I spoke of the fact that I had several, I connected with several people who were also in the same line of business. But what I connected with them for was not for friendship. I connected with them so that I can be looking at the things they're achieving and use that to hone my strategies. So I was only looking at their business moves, looking at their business success and all. But I was not engaging them as friends, trying to share the burdens, trying to tell them this is what I'm experiencing, trying to listen to their experience and all. No. I only saw them as business tools. So now you must not see the people in your life as tools to achieve your career goals. People are not tools. People are not tools. So you don't use people as sim simply as ladders to get to your career goals. Engage with them relate to them, share your journey with them, share your experiences with them, listen to the experience that they have, listen to their journey, provide support for them, get support from them. That is how to have a strong social network. And just add this, in case there's someone here that is thinking, I don't know how to make friends, I'm living a very lonely life. The number one key to making friends is to show genuine interest in the person you are trying to be friends with. Now, this might be counterproductive if you look at it from the face level. For example, now you are thinking, I have a very lonely life. I need someone that will come into my life to come and help me. But the way you are going to get that is not by going to people and telling them about yourself and trying to show them how amazing you are and trying to tell them all the stories of everything that's happening in your life. No, you are not going to build connection that way. Everybody loves to share their story. So the same way you want to share your story, that person you're also going to talk to wants to share their own story. Now, the, the fact that everybody wants to share their story is already a problem. As much as the solution, as, lot, as much as the strategy, it's also a problem because it means there are 1 million people, just say in your the area where you live, let's say there are 1 million people here and everybody wants to share their story. So it means there are 1 million people willing to share their story and zero persons willing to listen because every single person is obsessed with sharing their story. So you are going to stand out when you are that one person that is willing to listen. So if you approach someone now who is willing to share their story, and rather than going to share your story like everybody else is doing, you go to that person with listening ears and listen to the person share their story and ask them questions, try to come into their life, try to see how you can help them. You are going to stand out among the entire friends and the entire group of friends that you have. 
because obviously we know that most people are so obsessed with sharing their own stories. So you, the person who is the listener, you are going to be more attractive to people than those who are just sharing their stories. Now, after you have now made yourself attractive by showing interest in them, by asking them questions, by listening to their stories, then when that connection has, be has begun to build, you begin to share your stories as well. Now, I'm not saying that you should just be a person who listens forever. No, if you're only listening and you're not talking, you are not going to fully enjoy the benefit of social networks. But you must make it the point of call to show genuine interest in the person first. That should be your first move. Then after that, you can begin to share your stories. After that, begin to share your experience. The thing is, every good friend, as much as they want to share your story, they also want to listen. So, but once you take put that right foot forward by being the person to listen, then you have stirred within them a desire for you. And once they have that desire for you, once they have that desire to spend more time with you, then you can begin to share your stories and they will not be bored by, by listening to your stories. So I hope that will help someone who is wondering that you don't know how to increase the social networks and make friends. <laughs> so that's it for this point. You need to leverage the support of social networks. Don't despise your family. Don't be so obsessed with your career goals that you don't pay attention to your parents, to your children, to your wife, to your friends. People are not tools. People are not tools. Don't use them and dump. All right. So the next healthy balance now is to use your hobbies and healthy entertainment options to cool off and avoid burnout. I mentioned what burnout is earlier. Burnout happens when you are spending all your time, all your energy, all your resources, all your attention in chasing a particular goal and you are not getting as much result as you want or as you desire from it. What it results to is burnout. However, you can avoid burnout by having some hobbies and healthy entertainment options. For example, you should have like one day off, if not weekly, at least bi-weekly and so on, where you just go outside and do things for the fun of it. One thing I noticed that is common among those of us who are who like productivity so much, those of us who are always trying to be productive, is that we measure every single activity by how much input or how much output we are getting from it. So when you are reading a book, for instance, you are reading it because you know that this book will increase my knowledge and thereby increase the level of success I have in my career. When you are resting, when you are sleeping, you are sleeping because you need to conserve energy to do tomorrow's work. When you are talking to your friend, you are talking to them because you are trying to pitch a business idea so that you can get your career goals. When you are attending a conference, you are attending it because you want to create networks and get knowledge to get your career goals. Notice that everything I've been listening so far, the end goal is always career goals. This is not healthy. There are some things you should also do in your life for the fun of it, not necessarily because you are trying to get career goals. Now, these are the hobbies that I'm talking about. That you can just go outside and play some games. You are not playing that game because you are trying to learn one new skill for your career. No, you are playing the game because you simply enjoy it. The thing is, your body knows and your mind knows when you are engaging in every activity for the sake of work, your body knows that this is not play. So it is still work. Although it might look fun on the outside, deep within you, you know that this is still work because the end goal is still your career. So that cannot be counted as rest. You are going to enjoy the benefits of rest and relaxation more 
when you have a number of things that you do just for the fun of it, that you go for camping with your friends, you go for excursions to new cities just for the fun of it. That is true relaxation. So you are not trying to measure the ROI, the return on investment on the on every single step you take. Where you can go out to a restaurant, for instance, just by yourself. Not because you are going for a business meeting there, but because you simply just want to relax and you enjoy it for the fun of it. That is true relaxation. And as if you do that at intervals, at, at every point, at several points in your life, you just take out time to enjoy things for the fun of them. You are not going to fall into burnout because your entire life is not so is your entire life is not focused on work you have good work and you have good play you have good labor and you have good rest that way you are not going to fall into burnout hope that is clear oh, yes all right okay. um, yes so we are moving to the end very quickly i'll give i'll soon give room for questions. So number seven is to periodically reassess your values, your beliefs, priorities, and passion to realign your goals accordingly. Now, I mentioned earlier that things are always changing. The same way society is changing, the same way the business landscape is changing, the same way the career landscape is changing as well you as a person you are also changing the things you used to like 10 years ago there are some of them you don't like anymore the things you are passionate about the things you believed some even as much as six months ago there are some things you believed six months ago that you don't believe them anymore so as much as i said that you should have a plan and that plan should be broken into steps, into daily action steps. That does not mean that your plans are absolute and cannot be changed. If you made a plan five years ago that this is what I, this is the step I want to take in my business, and currently you notice that things have changed, your values have changed, your beliefs have changed, your priorities have changed. It is required and it's totally fine and even required that you readjust your plans and readjust your goals to align to what you are tilting towards currently because if you are if you are now a different person and you are still chasing goals and following plans that were made for that previous person that you were you are not going to be in a good of optimal state. Remember, let me show you this slide. Remember when in this slide, I told you that one of the money and work issue that causes stress is when people are being unhappy on their job. So one thing that happens, one thing that leads to unhappiness in the job is when the thing you are, the work you are doing does not align with your passion. The work you are doing does not align with your values. The work you are doing does not align with your priorities, does not align with your beliefs as well. That can lead to unhappiness and unhappiness will lead to stress. Disalignment. Disalignment will lead to unhappiness. Unhappiness leads to stress. So there is a responsibility of you that at intervals in your life, you bring up your goals, you bring up your plans, you reassess them. What do I want? What am I trying to achieve? What matters most to me at this point of my life? What are my new desires? Okay, before I was saying I want to make 1 million rupees before the age of 25. Is that really necessary? Maybe when you're saying that you're single, and now you are married. Your priorities have changed. You are now discovering that beyond money, 
there are also other things that you need. Probably you discover that you and your wife, you're having several fights and that is not good. So in, you have, in this point, you have noticed that money is no longer the biggest priority to you. You also need to learn communication skills in order to stop fighting with your wife. So at that point, you might need to reduce the goal of chasing your millions and also work on building relational skills, building communication skills, so that to put your home in good shape. But if you just simply stick to that plan you have made before when you're single and you don't readjust it to your new current, to your current state, your family, your marriage is going to severely suffer. So what I'm simply emphasizing is that to really be healthy. Uh, okay, this is even the last, not second to the last. Yeah, to really be healthy, you must periodically reassess your values, your beliefs, your priorities and passion and realign your goals to accordingly. Realign your goals to match your current state. Realign your plans to match your new goals. And as you continue that, you are going to continually achieve your goals while you also maintain that mental wellness. Okay, so let me just run it from number one to seven again, and I'll begin to take questions. So number one, I said, detach your sense of what from the attainment of goals. Your goals do not define you. You are the one that define your goals. Number two, avoid setting abstract goals. A goal without a plan is simply a wish. So, and if wishes were horses, even beggars will ride. So your goal without a plan is simply a wish. You must have a plan. And don't just have a plan, but your plan must be broken down to daily action steps that can take you from where you are. Don't plan with the money that you don't have. Maybe you are hoping that, I think my uncle somewhere is going to dash me money. My uncle somewhere is going to lend me money or is going to give me money. So whenever he gives me, gives me the money, I'm going to use it to fund my business. That is not the plan. You can't plan with something that's something that is not yours. No. You only plan with what you have at the moment and where you are at the moment. That's concrete plan. Number three, you come to terms with the reality of failure. Failure is a part of life. And there are only there are two causes of failure. One, it might simply be the circumstances of life that are within that are outside your control. And number two, it can be because of a process or a strategy that you took that is not correct. Either of these two ways, it, you are not a problem. You can always readjust or adapt to the new trend and you are going to succeed. Number three is to work. Don't be so obsessed with trying to balance your mental health that you don't work. Pressure does not kill. If you don't use your brain, it's going to atrophy. Like I said, atrophy is when something begins to decline because you are not using it. If you don't use your brain, it's, been, it's not going to grow. But the more you use it, it grows. Don't choose hard work over smart work. And don't choose smart work over hard work. It is hard work plus smart work that is equals to big goals. Hard work plus smart work equals to big goals. Number five, leverage the support of your social network. Don't use people simply as tools to attain your career goals, but instead relate with them. Show genuine interest in their life, share in their stories, share in their pains, share in their burdens, and also share your stories, share your burdens, share your pains, share your successes with them as well. That is getting social probing. The next is to use hobby and healthy entertainment. Now there's something I didn't talk about and that's healthy entertainment. There are some entertainments that are not healthy. There are some form of entertainment that people engage in that it ends up having negative effect on them. For example, there are people who watch porn as entertainment, 
that is an unhealthy form of entertainment. What it's going to do to you is just going to increase your dopamine level that your sense of reward will become so altered that you will no longer get excited about things that should get you excited anymore. So make sure that the entertainment options you are going for are healthy. There are some people that engage in overeating now as a form of entertainment. That's also wrong. Alcohol, using alcohol as entertainment. I know this might be cultural. You might say, okay, yes, my culture, alcohol is accepted. Now, I'm not saying this from a religious or any point of view. You can do whatever you want with your life. But some negative effect. So even though you want to engage in alcohol, do it with the consciousness that there is a limit to what I can do and this can affect my health. Smoking for, ent for entertainment as well. These are not healthy entertainment options. They can have a toll on your mental health and your physical health. So number seven, periodically assess your values, your beliefs and align your goals accordingly. The fact that you planned th three years or three months ago does not mean you still have to follow that plan today. You can change or you, you change and your plans should change as well. You change your goals to change as well. Don't keep running with an old goal that will keep on keeping you sad. Yeah, so that's it's the end of my presentation. And now I'll be giving room for questions and answers. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Olusudan. Uh, it was really insightful the way you shared your presentation and, and helped us gain insight about the mental health awareness. So uh, as a participant, as most of the participants here are youth. So we face this kind of problems and it re it's really going to help us because the way you shared it and the way you uh, just made it simple to understand the psychological concept behind it. So it was very insightful for us. So now I would like to ask the participants to ask questions in the chat box uh, so that Mr. Olusagan can reply to it accordingly. Thank you. Okay, so what are some signs that my mental health is being affected by my job? Okay, I think on face value, most um, Ru Raunak, sorry, I didn't pronounce your name well. And hope you can hear me. Yeah. So most mental health issues, they can tell from your feelings, and you can tell from your feelings and emotions. You can tell from your feelings and your emotions. Now, for some serious mental health issues like disorders and so on. You cannot diagnose by yourself. You might need to speak with a therapist or, or so. But something like stress, something like burnout, something like depression, you can just, you can feel it. It is obvious that whenever you think about your job, you are constantly feeling sad, for instance. Whenever you, if you get an option to avoid it, you are going to gladly do. So these are signs that are showing you that, okay, this thing is having some form of negative effect on me. So it will tell, you will tell by stress, you will tell by loss of passion, you will tell by burnout. These signs are always visible. That even though you might not be able to pinpoint what exactly is wrong, but you'll be able to tell that something is not going on fine. I hope that answers your question. Next question says, thank you, Hart. you're welcome. How to face and deal with toxic work colleagues? Yes, 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 yes. Now, that was something I didn't add in that first slide or the third slide where I was talking about work and money as a major cause of stress. Another workplace cause of stress is toxic colleagues, toxic bosses, and so on. So what you can do mainly in this it's in 
I'm going to split my answer into three forms, into three different forms. Number one, you might need to walk up to that person and try to talk to them. If it is something the person is doing that they are intentionally doing it, or maybe they are unknowingly doing something that is directly having an impact on you, you might want to walk up to them and say, okay, this and this and this is what I've been noticing you do. And it's affecting me in this and this and this way. If you have an H a HR department in your working place, I think that would be a good way to address it. But if you don't have, you can walk up to the person and try to talk to the person. If it's a superior that... Okay, before I come to the superior. So if after you have told that person and the person is not making any adjustment, you might want to talk to a superior and say, okay, this and this is what I'm noticing. And I really love this person to adjust. And because it's a workplace, because the workplace always put ahead that what that person is doing is affecting your effectiveness. Because that is the overall goal of the, of the organization to get more productivity from their workers. So if you can help the team and the people in charge see that this thing is affecting your productiveness, it is more likely that you're going to address it. Now, I know there are some people that no matter what you see, they are not going to adjust. That is now the point where I feel you can relate it to people who are above and try to let them see that this and this and this is what happened. Now, if it's not someone who is a superior to you and you have complained, you have talked, and nothing is done, I will suggest that you also have some self-care practices. That is some things that can help you support yourself. For example, if that person always comes up when you're having some kind of conversations. You might want to reduce the number of times you have such conversations with the person. And try as much as you can to just regulate the interactions you have with such person, helping you maintain that healthy balance. You can also have time out where you can just rest and relax. However, in all of this, if it is too toxic and you are noticing that it's having a big toll on you, like it's really affecting you, you should begin to consider options to leave. Begin to strategize, begin to plan. And can be probably where other place can you pivot to and begin to work. I'm not saying I'm, you might not be able to leave immediately because of the financial implication, but begin to work on leaving. Because there are some things, there are some Toxic work places that they cannot be managed. There are some, if you know, okay, something I can manage, you can try. But there are some that should not be managed at all. That's the best thing for you is just to leave the environment. Okay. I hope I was able to provide a good enough answer for that. So how can I manage stress and avoid burnout in my job? Oh, uh, I think... The seven, the seven steps we listed in the slides kind of answer these questions already. For example, I talked about, let me just highlight some that can directly help you stress. When you begin to leverage on hobbies now, I talked about having hobbies that you, your life is not all, up, all just focused on work, work, work. That there are some things you also do for the fun of it. That is something that can help you avoid burnout. But if you are just so obsessed with work, like you don't create time for rest, you don't create time for recreation, you don't have hobbies, you don't have leisure activities, that is a sure sign to burn, to burn out and stress. Another one is leveraging your social connections, where you can share your burdens with friends and family, where you spend time with them. I know that's one way to also manage stress and avoid burnout. But... If you really follow the seven steps I highlighted in this slide, it's going to help you with burnout and stress. All right. The next one, 
says, how do we give support to someone who is on the verge of burnout? Okay, 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 okay. Yo. To give support, the first step will just be to talk. Now, one thing we do in counseling when we when we come for counseling sessions is that we don't really do miracles or just do some things that will change the person all of a sudden. But it's something called talk therapy. Where as a counselor, we just engage that person in a conversation, allow them to share your story, allow them to share the experiences and listen to them and ask them questions. And by simply just talking, many times we notice in therapy sessions that the person gets clarity, the person feels calm, the, first, the person is able to regain their strength by simply just talking to us. So I think that is one very good way to help. When you can just provide a listening ear, a form of availability for that person and, see, and let the person know that okay, I'm here for you. I'm here to help you navigate what you are going through. It really helps. It really helps. That's the first form of support you can give. Listen to them. And when, when you're listening, don't listen with that eagerness to give advice because I know that's that's something that we fall into many times that when you're trying to help your friend, you're, you're just trying to give them so much advice. It does not really work. When, by giving them advice, what you are doing is that you are increasing the level of stress they are facing because the, someone who is on the verge of burnout, their mind is full of I need to do this. I need to do this. I'm not getting this. So there are just so much to do on their mind. So by giving them advice, what you are doing is like, you are just loading them with more things to do. But when you come from a point of, don't worry, just tell me how, tell me what you are feeling and you are and listening to them. You are, rather than adding something to them, you are easing them of that body. Then what you are going to do next we also depend on what, how the conversation goes. If the person talks to you and you discover, okay, you might, most times when we look at people's issues as a third party, we can always tell what is wrong. So when you listen to the person, you might be able to notice that probably this person is not resting enough. And you just ask the person, have you considered maybe sleeping more? Or you can ask them, when was the last time you took some fruit and or just try to engage them. And by simply listening, by sim simply being available, it will open up a whole lot of, a whole, a new world of possibilities for you and that person. They're able to give them other forms of support. But it starts with listening first. Right, I hope that helps. Then the next question says, uh, Sorry, I just lost that. Okay. The next question says, how do you keep yourself motivated and engaged in your career? What is your secret? Mm -hmm. Now, this is kind of a very tricky question because the concept of motivation kind of varies with every, with every person. But I can only share my experience then I'll pro pro provide some other tips that might help, might help. So for me, one thing I do is I'm motivated mainly by two things. Firstly is the need to help because the nature of work I do is the helping profession that's counseling, therapy, and the likes. So I'm daily dealing with people. And at some point, when you're beginning to feel discouraged, when I'm beginning to feel discouraged, someone will just come and share their body and say, this is what I'm going through, this is what I'm going through. And there's just that inner desire within me to help that person. So when I'm tired, when I'm saying, okay, I don't want to do this again, but just seeing that there's someone who has a need, 
that should be met, it stirs up a new form of passion, in forms of, of desire to do the work. That's the first one. And the second one, <laughs> okay, I think there's also the financial aspect to it that there needs to be met. So whether they are motivated or not, you just have to, there are bills, there are bills to cover. So you have to get up and do the work. But something that can help is try to find a healthy balance of doing something that that really makes, sorry, do something that really resonates with your values. Or do something that you enjoy doing. Once you can find that sweet spot. Now, don't do something you enjoy doing that cannot bring you money. Because at the end, you still end up being frustrated. But try to find a sweet spot of doing something that engages you. That you don't feel redundant. That the work itself is exciting. And once you can get that, a lot of the motivation issues is going to be resolved. You are you are still going to need discipline to get up and work, but the at the core of it, you just ensure you don't hate your job. You might not love it. It might not be something that makes you laugh every day, but make sure you don't hate it. If it's something you hate, you are going to constantly need motivation for the rest of your life, and it's not going to work that way. And once it's settled, at some point, you might just want to remind yourself, why exactly did I start this? Maybe I've been doing this work for about two years and you really enjoyed it. And all of a sudden, you're no longer feeling motivated. You might want to sit down and do some interrogation, interrogation session for yourself and ask, what exactly was exciting me when I started this? What was my motivation then? And probably by just reminding yourself, Okay, this is why I started. This what what is this is what I was trying to achieve then. Then it can push you and just remind you and give you that motivation afresh. But like I said in the seventh slide, there are some times where you are you have simply lost motivation because your passions, your interests, your beliefs and values have changed. So at such point, if you are trying to motivate yourself forever, it's going to be very frustrating. You might just need to change, begin to set new career goals, begin to set new plans. And that can... Okay. Now, it says, if any employee get goes over to a counselor for help, and there's a probable diagnosis that this person has developed a mood disorder, what kind of therapeutic approach can be taken by the counselor okay i am a cognitive behavior therapist and most times cognitive behavior therapy kind of works for many many mental health and many mental health disorders this kind of works however we can also adjust based on the specific situation of the person there's some times where we might need to employ kind of this systematic desensitization. These are very like psychological stuff. And I think maybe for you to have asked, you might have a background in that. But I think there is no one size fits all approach that works for every situation. Most times we just try to appraise the person try to ask them questions. And from what we're able to discover from that person, then that will give a guide to the approach that's going to be best for the specific person. Sorry, I couldn't, I cannot give more details because most times things are very different for each person and we have to adapt and adjust. Sometimes my need to combine three different approaches depending on the peculiarity of the person's case and I know. So the last question here, it says, as a mental health professional, how do you disconnect yourself from your work? Because this profession needs you to be very empathetic and it must cause you stress. Yes, 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 yes. 
there are some days where you just keep hearing sad stories. This person will come and said his mom is dead. This person will come and said he has a relationship breakup. This person will come and says, I say he's not happy. And for the entire day, all you keep hearing is sad stories. And if fear is not taken, you might just adapt to that sadness. And you begin to live in the sadness of other people that you have contacted through being a counselor. I think over the years, I've been able to learn how to detach myself from the situation. Now, being empathetic requires as well that I put myself in the person's shoes. But by putting myself in the person's shoe, it does not mean I take that person's issue and make it my issue. If I take that person's issue and make it my issue, then that's also going against empathy. Because one thing that you must maintain while being empathetic is that you should not be emotionally involved in the person's case. Because once you're emotionally involved, you begin to be biased like the person is biased. One of the reasons why clients cannot help themselves is because they are emotionally involved in the situation. So there are some things they cannot see simply because emotions have covered their eyes. So I've been able to learn like a perfect balance to not take up that issue as my own and just be there for the person, give them that support. But many times, even once the session is over, to meet me one hour later, I can I might not be able to remember all the details of what the person is going through because I didn't take it on as my problem. I, I was just present at that moment, present for them at that moment, give them the support I, I can give them at that moment. But I don't take up the issue as mine. But this being said, there are still some times where it can get really personal and it begins to feel, wow, this, this pain is so much. And you begin to share the person's pain. Such times, what I also do as well is to leverage my own support systems. I think that should be slide five and six. What I talked about, leveraging friends and families and engaging in hobbies and all. So that also ways that if I say, okay, this thing is really getting personal, I'll just go and engage in some activities that will take my gaze away from work, that will take my gaze away from the issues that people have shared Sometimes go out the gist with friends, not just about the person's, you go and talk with friends, not talk about the person's problem, but just talk about something else that's not related to work and you just enjoy that, that support that you get from social network. It really helps. And one thing I want to say after looking at all these questions is that these seven points that I listed they really help. I really want you to take it to heart because many of these issues, many of these questions that we are asking, in a way, they might not be directly, but in a way, they are going to be addressed automatically by simply sticking to these seven things I've listed today. It will give you the healthy balance that your career will not suffer, but also your mental health will not suffer. Okay, I hope I've been able to do justice to these questions. Uh, yes, the I guess the questions are over for now. So, Mr. Wallace, yeah. it was very uh, it was very informative the way you uh, answered the questions and the doubts asked by the participants, and also some of the questions were asked out from the topic. So, I guess you were comfortable answering that also. And so, yeah. as we, um, uh, so uh, like, uh. The topic is very vast, so we, uh, I guess, we're gonna need some more workshops or webinars to uh, make uh, this topic understand to the public in a very vast sense. So, as we are near the closing ceremony, before we depart, we would like to thank you, Mr. Alusigan, for sharing such in insights. Uh, Dinesh Agarwal, Simran Sharma, Pradeep Mukherjee, and all the responsible members for making this webinar a success. 
So thank you everyone for uh, for being present here. And also I will be sharing a feedback link in the chat box. So uh, please give your valuable feedback and also we we'll like your feedback and work on it and improve ourselves. Mr. Olsuka, you can also give us a feedback if you didn't like anything about us.